there are many people here in the audience tonight that have dedicated their lives to children with special needs and to, to children overall. Uh, people in medicine, people in politics, people in journalism, people in nursing, physiotherapy. And tonight we have two very strong advocates for children. Uh, and we're very delighted to have Susan Dennehy, award-winning radio producer and reporter, and Dr. Catherine Zapone, Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. So I'd like to introduce Susan Dennehy first as our first speaker this evening. Uh, Susan trained as a radio producer in RTE, uh, and she's been producing radio documentaries and reports for both News Talk and RTE One for 15 years. Susan has particular interest in the areas of social justice, and in recent years she's become known for producing quality work uh, with a disability theme. 2016 was a very busy year for her. She produced Voices from the Spectrum, a series of reports for the Pat Kenny Show, which investigated the experience of Irish children on the autism spectrum and their families. Incredible work, incredible work. Her documentary, A Boy from the Northwest, about the life of one of Ireland's first wheelchair users, won a PPI award. She also produced Personal Best, the story behind Irish women in Paralympic sport for News Talk. In addition to her work as a radio producer and reporter, Susan writes regularly for Spoke Out, the Irish Wheelchair Association magazine. She has personal experience with disability with her 12-year-old daughter is a wheelchair user. And the documentary about her own family's experience coming to terms with their daughter's condition was broadcast on RTE and shortlisted for a PPI award. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Susan Denny. It's both an honour and a pleasure to be here this evening to speak to you about this topic. Before I begin, I'd like to say, take a moment to say how significant it is um, that the Biological Society, with Paul O'Neill at the helm, has chosen the topic of disability, in particular children with special needs, for this evening's event. Discussion about the experience of Irish children who live with disability is important. It matters because, like other vulnerable and marginalised groups in our society in the past and in the present, their voices are not currently being heard. My own insights into the area come from two areas, and Paul has outlined those. My own personal experience as a mother of a child with a disability has been a steep learning curve over the last 12 years. And my work making documentaries, many of which have a disability theme, has now, um, is a subject, I make documentaries with that theme because it's a subject that I have now become totally passionate about. Um, when I sat down to prepare for tonight's lecture, I thought to myself, how on earth am I going to pick one aspect of this vast and multifaceted subject to talk about? I considered playing extracts from my back catalogue of work because with each of those documentaries, I met somebody or people, families or individuals who taught me something new about disability. So I could have told you about this man, um, Jack Kerrigan was paralysed in a diving accident at the age of 20 and he was one of the first wheelchair users in this country. He would have had his disability in the 1940s and the 1950s and that documentary I made was about his rediscovery of self-worth and that's a theme that will reoccur again and again in my discussion with you this evening. He rediscovered his sense of self-worth, which was on the floor following his accident. And um, he was living in Ireland at a time when children with disabilities were hidden in bedrooms and parlours up and down the country. And rehabilitation was a brand new science. This was, this was a very recent thing in terms of medical history. So I could have um, <coughs> played for you the voice of this woman here. Her name is Christiana and she's a mother to three boys. Brian is on the autistic spectrum and he would be at the classical end. Um, and this is her, she's, I spent a week with her in the, in the water, the cold water of Banna Beach in Kerry, where she was, her son was learning how to surf with the group Surf to Heal. And in her own words, Christiana was doing this because surfing might be something that her son could do another skill that he might acquire. Or I could have introduced you to two of the women who featured in my most recent documentary. Um, 
two of the strongest women I know, both at the top of their game on the world stage of competitive sport, both of whom had a physical disability growing up, and both of whom were very determined young ladies. But I decided to take what we call in the media a bold editorial decision. I decided to do what we documentary makers do best. I decided to tell you a personal story that highlights the wider issues on this topic. I decided to tell you my own story. Um, so let's go back to spring 2005. I was 35 years old. I was happily married with three young children. My husband and I were very happy professionally. Disability was nowhere near my radar. And like most young professionals, we had our hopes and dreams and we had our plan and everything was going accordingly. Then on the 23rd of May, we were both at work when we received a phone call. Grace, our youngest daughter, who was just a year at the time, had suffered two febrile convulsions brought on by a high temperature caused by what we found out later was a mild strain of viral meningitis. Grace was in Temple Street fighting for her life and that phone call was the beginning of our lives going in a whole new direction. And it was the beginning of my learning curve around disability. So to cut a long story short, following a stint in, IC in ICU, Grace seemed to recover well, but within months it was apparent that something was not quite right. Um, we had an MRI done which revealed shadows in the white matter of Grace's brain, and her prognosis changed at that time. So we heard the news that every parent, parent dreads that Grace, her abilities would certainly be affected in some way and Grace would have a disability. Now, I can't describe what kind of a body blow that was for us as parents. Initially, it's a kind of a shock that you go into. And after some time, that shock becomes a type of grief. And you might think grief is a bit of a strong word here. We were grieving, as I look back now, the loss of the child we thought we had. And we were grieving the loss of the carefree life we had planned for ourselves. And that's an important part of the process, and it was for us as parents. But as I reflect now, and knowing what I know now, I, I'm aware of how my reaction was compounded and was far more negative than it needed to be, because I didn't know anything about disability. I didn't know anyone with a disability. Nobody in my primary or secondary school had a disability. Nobody at the university where I studied had a disability. I never came across anyone in the media who had a disability. So the only point of reference I had was the only person I'd ever come across in my whole life, up to 35 years of age, that had a disability. And it was a young boy who, in the neighborhood of 1970s Cork, suburban Cork, where I grew up, spent all his days in the garden by himself and was only ever referred to in very hushed and sympathetic tones by the people in the neighbourhood. I look back now and I see this child probably had classical autism. And I wonder how it would be for him today. He, unfortunately, was part of the generation, the, what I call the Shagod Lovas generation. They didn't know how to deal with people with disabilities other than how to pity them. So, with that point of reference, you can imagine, that being my only point of reference, when I heard the news about Grace, I was scared. I was scared for my daughter, and I was scared for myself. So, because Grace had no diagnosis when we went home from hospital, there was no clear path. I couldn't see how I was going to live with a child who could neither walk nor talk, possibly. That was all unclear to us. On some level, the ignorant attitudes of the past were informing me. And I'm now sorry to admit that something that felt like shame was part of the mix of emotions that were going on for me at that time. I felt shame because in my flawed thinking at that time, disability felt like some kind of a failure. Failure when someone spoke to my daughter and she couldn't answer. 
failure or embarrassment when we held up the queue for places because I couldn't transfer her quickly enough. And failure when the service user's bus pulled up at the front door, it felt like a big sign outside our house that said there's something wrong with this child. I'm now embarrassed to admit how ignorant I was at that time, but I feel like I must admit it. Because the damaging attitude that someone with a disability is somehow less than and not equal to others is still very much alive today. Not knowing how else to cope with Grace's um, disability, my, her, her well-being became the focus of virtually all my time and attention. I gave up work. Like many parents of children with disabilities, I gave up work. I took her to intensive speech, speech and language therapy sessions, took her to as much OT, took her for as much physio as we possibly could, accessed equipment to help with her mobility. We tried Reiki, acupuncture, horse riding, you name it, I was on it. Being the perfectionist that I was, I wasn't going to leave any stone unturned. I was doing what Paul mentioned earlier. I was doing everything in my power to fix my daughter. And the fact that I was trying to fix her indicates to me now that at some level, I was not accepting her disability. I didn't understand yet that there are many ways to live in the world. There are many ways to live in the world. On the other hand, some of our efforts paid off. And after hours and hours and hours of speech therapy, by God, I never want to blow another bubble in my life. Um, and two years of using sign language as a bridge, we used love with grace, she finally and slowly regained her full power of speech. And she's fully verbal now. Too verbal sometimes. But anyway. So despite the gains she made in terms of her speech, grace didn't regain enough strength to enable her to walk. And she remains with a physical disability and uses a wheelchair full time now. So I'd like to hit pause on, the on my own story there for a moment, because I think it's really worth noting the nature of the overriding challenge that we faced as a family and that we continue to face dealing with our daughter's disability. What we had to do was to find the balance between accepting Grace's limitations while at the same time giving her all the resources we could to enable her to unlock her potential. And it's my belief that our government and the agencies of the government who have responsibility for the health and education of our children face exactly that challenge on a macro scale. Let me just see if I can... Ha. How do we best support children with disabilities to achieve their potential, all the while acknowledging their limitations and respecting their difference from children who are able-bodied and neurotypical. Having personally witnessed the power of good quality early intervention in terms of speech therapy, I shiver, for example, when I look at the waiting lists of children in this country waiting for speech therapy. Assessment and intervention services. In the latest figures published, let me just confirm, 15,000 children on waiting lists for assessment alone. So back to my own experience. For the next few years, we began to adapt to our new version of family life. I won't say it was easy. Some of the experiences were bewildering, and there was a continuous need to dig deep, to find the dignity, to deal with the attitudes we met regularly. Grace was often ignored. People we met would speak to me when she was sitting right beside me. They spoke to me as if she wasn't there. She was patronized. We were flabbergasted on one occasion on Grafton Street when a, a, a lady handed her some money. Now, Grace was quite happy about that, I might add, but <laughs> she, she was coming from quite a different place. I'd say her siblings weren't happy either. Um, Grace was attending preschool and then school at CRC, which for those of you that don't know, it's the Central Remedial Cl Clinic, and it's a specialised centre dealing with children who have physical disabilities. And I have to say, pre-recession, the service she received there was good. 
But at six years of age, the psychologist working with her there recommended that Grace move to mainstream school. And we decided to go with that recommendation and to transfer her to our local Educate Together school. Our main concerns about the transition, our main concern was whether or not Grace would be included in a school where she was the only wheelchair user. Can you imagine being the only person of a particular kind in an institution? So one of our main anxieties was how would she handle the questions that other children would certainly ask. And we thought about it a lot and we developed a script. We wrote a script for her in preparation of heading off those awkward questions. So the script went something like this. Child A approaches you, Grace, what do you say? She says to you, why are you in that wheelchair? Why can't you walk? What's wrong with your legs? Grace's answer was, I'm good at lots of things, but I'm not so good at walking. What are you good at? I have to say, the process of carefully choosing those words, the words that would help other people accept our daughter for who she was, helped us accept our daughter for who she was. We were figuring it out as well. And it helped us to gain perspective on our situation. And it helped us to develop our mantra, and it's the mantra we still use today. Forget what you can't do. Focus on what you can do what you can do. So Grace settled well into mainstream school, and she's in fifth class now. By the way, the other children did not hold back on their questions, and the answer did seem to do the trick. They accepted her as she was. And apart from a few of them having power chair envy, Santa Claus got a few unusual requests that year, I think. <laughs> Some of the parents were cursing us. Um, she got on really well with her peers, and you know what? It kind of proved to us that negative attitudes to disability are things that we learn as we grow up. So I could leave it there and we'd have a happy ending and we all prefer those, right? But, and believe me, I'd like nothing better to report that Grace is fully supported inclu and included in her school, in her community and in society. But I can't do that. I can't tell you that because despite the fact that Grace has received some excellent support and care in her 12 years so far, she doesn't enjoy the same status or rights as her sister or her able-bodied peers, and she's excluded from participating in society every single day. Just gonna pop this slide up that you can be looking at while I explain what I've just said. I had to listen to an awful lot of personal testimonies in the interviews I did in the course of my work, an awful lot of them, before I could admit the truth, before I could admit what I suspected for a long time. And that is that the exclusion of children with special needs is still widespread in Irish society. Let me give you some examples of areas of life where this is happening. Our health system, which many of you will be part of, is failing children with special needs as it stands today. Disability services delivered by the HSE and non-statutory organisations are ad, ad hoc, to say the least. There's a huge variation in the service you get depending on where you live or what disability you have. Also, budgets and staffing levels in community services and in other disability services took a massive hit during the recession. And the net result is that we have those long waiting lists you know about, and we have a lot of um, children not receiving service at all. Black spots like Leash and Offaly. Another area, our education system is struggling to accommodate children with special needs. And those with autism spectrum disorder would report the poorest service in relation to this area. I've interviewed parents from all over the country who have children in an ALC or an assisted learning class, which is that class at the side of your mainstream school that deals with children who have intellectual disabilities often. And most of the children in those classes have autism spectrum disorder. And generally, the teachers teaching in those classes do not have training in autism. Now that's a challenge for the teacher, the child and the parents. Another area, our built environment, my hobby horse. 
Our built environment, because of poor planning and quality control, excludes children every day. I don't have to look too far. Finding a dished pavement. You've, have you ever seen that guy or that woman in their power chair going down the middle of the road and you think, what the heck are you doing? They're looking for a dish in the pavement to get up on the pavement to go about their day safely. I didn't understand that until I looked for a dish pavement. Um, on paper, these places are accessible. On paper, they're hitting the minimum standards. So there is a ramp, but the guy who puts it down to get you on the train is on his tea break. You miss your train. Or there is a key to the disabled toilet in the zoo. Again, a member of staff has that key and they're not around. Minimum standards aren't enough. We really need to be looking at quality planning in relation to our built environment for people with, with physical disabilities. And possibly the biggest barrier to true equality and inclusion, in my opinion, is the la staggering lack of knowledge and understanding. And that's actually easily fixed. Across all those areas I just described, and in the general population as well. So whether it's Down syndrome, whether it's autism or cerebral palsy, when people don't understand why a child presents the way they do, or why they behave the way they do. They can't interact successfully with that child. And then nine times out of 10, they're going to have a poor attitude towards them. So what can be done? How do we address these barriers to inclusion? And how do we start valuing, let alone cherishing, all the children of the state equally? Well, actually, there's a lot of practical things that can be done if the political will were there. There are initiatives some of which cost very little, that could make a huge difference. But what we need first and foremost is a sea change of attitude. As we witnessed recently with the experience of the LGBT community, legitimizing people's equal status can have an enormous impact on their quality of life and their freedoms. So, Staying in the vein of documentary making, I'm going to leave you tonight not with a happy ending, but with a question. Well, two questions, really. It's important that we ask, why, at the highest legislative level, has our government not yet committed themselves fully to the rights of people with disabilities? The Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities is an international agreement it's directed at changing attitudes and approaches to persons with disabilities. And 10 years after EU countries signed up to it, which meant they agreed it was a good idea, Ireland remains the last country to ratify it, which means it's officially going to work within your jurisdiction. 10 years later, the last country to sign up to it. And I'm sure you've seen news reports about the disability groups who are very vocal about this. This is a big issue for people with disabilities because it's the bedrock on how we will move forward. And secondly, and finally, if children with disabilities, who grow up to be adults with disabilities, by the way, are having difficulties accessing their human rights in 2017, what do you think that tells us about ourselves? Thank you for listening.